Hi, and welcome to worship today. I'm the Reverend Nicole Riley, the lead and teaching pastor here. Welcome to our classic celebration. I invite you to connect with us. You can do that with our QR code, which will give you an opportunity to let us know that you were here. You can also let us know any needs or prayer requests you have. We have a couple things going on we'd love to let you know about. The first is worship on the lawn. We are gathering for in-person worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. You can find out all about it and register on the slide you see. We also have a workshop on anti-racism coming up. This is a workshop where you'll have an opportunity to hear a wonderful speaker, Reverend Dr. Cedric Bridgeforth, who will share with us and help us to grow as people. We invite you to join us and register. And Trunk or Treat is coming. It will be a little different this year, but it's an opportunity for us to remember and to celebrate this time of the year with our children. You have to register to be part, so you'll see a QR code that will let you do that. For all the things that are going on in the church, you'll find out information on our church's website. Today, we continue our series, Tasting Grace, and Pastor Michelle will be sharing with us about hospitality and why that matters so much as we talk about God's grace. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here.
Let us pray. Loving and holy God, your generosity toward us welcomes us, calls us to your table of love and grace, no matter who we are and no matter how far we have strayed from you. Your hospitality reminds us how much it matters to be welcomed, to be included, to be loved. And so today we lift up all of those who feel excluded from tables, from families, from communities. We pray for those who feel that there is no place where they are home. We pray for those who are suffering, those who are dealing with loss of jobs, those who are dealing with health issues, whether it is COVID or the flu or cancer. God, in the midst of times like these, we lean into your strength and love. We seek you. We need you. And so we open our hearts to you as we gather for worship this day, knowing that you meet us here and that you welcome us. You pull out a chair for us. You make us comfortable. And in that, you call us. You call us to be your people, to be your hands and feet in this world, to share your love and grace with others. And so today we come with open hearts, with a desire to become more your people. We come to be healed of the things that stop us and hold us back from truly being who we are in the world. We ask for your touch and your care, knowing that it is always there for us, waiting for us to reach out for it. Thank you, God. Thank you for all that you have done in Jesus. And thank you for all that you will yet do in this world, in our communities, in our lives. Enable us this day to trust you and to take that next step with you, to be honest with you, share our lives with you, not holding back, not feeling we need to pretend, but knowing that we can be truly who we are, truly who you've created us to be. And so today we come, and we know you receive us. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I would bet that most of us have had someone reach a spoon or a fork in our direction and say, here, taste this. Now, depending on who was doing the offering, you might be really happy to taste what was on that spoon. And then there might be others who you would think twice about before taking a taste. Our tastes differ. There are some foods that we think are delicious and others just can't imagine liking, no matter how much garlic or salt or sugar or whipped cream you put into or on top of it. Black olives are one of those things for me. There are things in, that I like that my family doesn't and things that they like that I don't. Food plays an integral part of our everyday life. We rely on it so that our bodies can function in the ways that they are supposed to. And for many of us, at different times of the year, food plays a part in our relationships. From recipes that are passed down from generation to generation, to traditional meals that you have at holidays, Food can play a role in our relationships with other people. In her book, Tasting Grace, television and home chef and author, Melissa D. Arabian, shares story from, stories from her life and her journey to understanding food not only as a gift from God, but as an invitation into a deeper relationship with God. In this series, Tasting Grace, we're looking at how we can experience the goodness of God through our own experiences of food in relation to community, in relation to scripture, in relation to how we know and have experienced God at work in our lives. We've talked about authenticity and last week about delight. And if you missed either of those, you can go back and watch them. And today we're talking about hospitality. So what comes to mind when you think about hospitality? Maybe it's a beautifully set table or a perfectly decorated house. Maybe you think of a host or hostess who welcomes you at the door dressed impeccably and invites you into a house that's full of delicious smells. And you notice that there's not a toy or a piece of laundry or a speck of dust in sight. For some of you, just mentioning hospitality makes you want to run and hide under a blanket because the decorating and the cooking and the expectation of perfection aren't your gifts and just the idea frightens and overwhelms you. But don't shut worship off just yet. Today we're not talking about that kind of hospitality. We have Pinterest and other things to help us in those areas. Today we're talking about biblical hospitality. And Melissa puts it this way. Biblical hospitality is about service, not performance. So what does society say about hospitality? Well, it all starts out innocently enough, right? We wanna have people over, we have a heart of service, and we want to welcome them into our homes. But somewhere along the line, we go down that slippery slope and we're hearing society say, impress your friends with this really easy recipe or make your friends think that you spent hours in the kitchen when you really only spent 15 minutes. In other words, society is saying, impress and perform for your friends. And that is hospitality. What does God say about hospitality? Well, God says biblical hospitality is about love of strangers and it's about service. God says that we invite in people so that we leave space for God to join us. So how can we RSVP to that invitation? Well, I've got a couple of ideas. One is Think about your language around hospitality when you're hosting people or thinking about hosting people, probably in your front yard right now. Is your language the language of separation and impressing people? Is your language um, thinking about company-worthy dishes or dazzling your friends or impressing them? 
Is it the language of creating a small pedestal where people come into your home impressed by you watching the performance? Or is it the language of unifying and bringing people together? The second challenge, I would say, as part of this RSVP, is to think about who we are including in our hospitality. Hospitality is love of strangers. We saw that with Abraham in Genesis. So it's not just about inviting our friends over after church on a Sunday. That's part of it. But my challenge to you is to increase the scope of who it is that we're including in hospitality. Biblical hospitality is about loving others through serving them. It's about sharing how you have experienced Jesus in your life with others in a way that invites them to maybe want to try some more. It's about sharing grace, the unearned and perfect and beautiful love that God has for you with people who might not yet know that God loves them. When you taste something that's new to you and you find it to be delicious, do you ever say, oh, thank you for that small taste. I've had enough. I'll go now. No. Tasting something delicious for us, especially the first time, makes us want more. And biblical hospitality is a way for us to offer goodness to others through our own experience as a way to maybe open the door for them to know that there's more and that there is some for them. It's helping someone else to see that our lives don't have to be perfect or perfectly put together or all cleaned up to earn God's love. God just loves us. God loves you. Biblical hospitality opens a way for people to understand that they are invited to feel welcome and comfortable, that someone cares enough about them to offer help or a meal or a glass of water. Many of us uh, tend to want to only see our best. No toys on the floor, no dirty laundry to be seen. We're uncomfortable being vulnerable and letting others see the imperfect parts of our lives even though we all have them. But the reality is when we strive to show perfection, we may be preventing someone else whose life is currently a mess to feel like they don't have a place. We hesitate to let people get close enough to our lives to see that we are also sometimes a mess. The Arabian writes this, hosting, hospitality means that we keep our figurative but sometimes literal dirty laundry out for others to see. I never quite know what to do the first time someone says to me, come on in, make yourself at home. I always wonder, does that mean it's okay to take off my shoes and put my feet on the couch or on the coffee table? Does it mean that I can help myself to some water out of the fridge if I'm thirsty or a snack from the pantry if I'm hungry? Or are they just saying it because it's the nice and hospitable and polite thing to say? It takes some time to navigate the complexity of that and even longer to actually feel at home in someone else's space. Being invited over to someone else's home for dinner and having the host say, hey, can you grab me a fork? They're in the drawer over there, is part of that invitation for me to feel at home, to feel comfortable, to feel like I'm more than a visitor or a guest, to feel like I'm important to them and valued by them. And I think faith can be similar for some people. It's through our encounters with Jesus that we begin to know him, that we begin to develop a relationship with him, and through him that we can know the goodness and love that God has for all of us. And in the space of that relationship, we begin to understand and claim that we can truly make ourselves at home in God's kingdom. We begin to understand and know that we don't have to come as perfect people who have it all figured out. We are invited to come as we are. 
with our questions, our doubts, our fears, our mistakes, into a relationship with Jesus that can change our lives. Who first invited you to know Jesus? Maybe Jesus was always a part of your life. It was a part of the pattern of living from before you can remember. Maybe you were a child or a teen when someone invited you to come to church or Sunday school or camp, and that's where you first met Jesus. Maybe you were older when you discovered Jesus. And maybe today you're wondering if there is even an invitation for you. I believe that Jesus is always with it, even when we don't know it and aren't aware of it. And sometimes, maybe a lot of the time, it takes someone else to help us remember and to know. It's part of the beauty of living in the community of the church. It's part of the beauty of being a part of a small group. This morning's scripture is the story of a couple of Jesus' followers who had been in Jerusalem in the time leading up to and at Jesus' death. They're walking, and they're talking, and they're having a difficult time trying to understand what had happened and what it all meant. Jeff will read it for us this morning. A reading from Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 31. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us, They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. So reads the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Luke tells us that Cleopas and the other, we don't ever know what the other's name is, are traveling from Jerusalem. Perhaps they're traveling back to their hometown. One commentator describes this as walking away from the disaster of Good Friday. The worst thing possible had happened. Jesus had died, and with his death, their hopes for the future were uncertain. I can just picture them walking side by side on a dusty road, not in any hurry to get where they were going, heads hung low, voices soft. And as they're walking, they're joined by another. Luke says they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. We can imagine that they were replaying what had happened in the previous days because we do the same thing. When something happens, when something big happens, we tell and retell the story 
trying, hoping that there is some sense to be made of it. And if we tell it and tell it again, that missing piece might fall into place that will make it okay. And it's into this moment, a moment of great despair for these two followers, that Jesus enters the picture as a stranger who simply joins them on the road. And he asks them this, what are you discussing together as you walk along? To put this in some um, light context, this might be like someone coming up to you at the grocery store on July 3rd and saying, why are all of the hamburgers and hot dogs gone? Right? We know that July 4th, a lot of us have barbecues and we have hamburgers and hot dogs and we might wonder where that person had been that they didn't know. Cleopas responds, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? Jesus' response to him opens the door for conversation. He asks, what things? Jesus invites them to tell their story. And what they share is their story of who they had known Jesus to be. Starting at verse 19, it says this. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Perhaps it's easy for us to see that they had all of the pieces. They knew who Jesus was. They had had hope in him. The tomb was empty, and there were angels who said he was alive. Maybe it's their despair that kept them from believing that that was true. How often is that us? How often does our faith tell us what is true, but somewhere in the details we get sidetracked and begin to doubt? How could Jesus be all that they hoped for themselves, their people, and their nation if he was dead? At this point in the story, Jesus' role takes a turn. He's no longer simply a stranger and walking companion. He begins to teach, urging them to remember what they had been taught from the scriptures. And he's a little bothered by the lack of their belief in what they should have known. The message version puts it this way. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophet said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning with the book of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. The words of this stranger were the words of scripture. Even though they didn't know yet that it was Jesus walking with them, they knew the stories. And maybe they began to see that what had happened on Good Friday and in the days since through the lens of the scripture, maybe they began to wonder if hope still existed. As the disciples arrive at their destination, Jesus um, acts as if he's going to continue on but they invite him to come in and spend the night with them as their guest. Now this is more than a polite invitation. For the people of ancient Israel, understanding themselves as strangers and sojourners with a responsibility to care for vulnerable strangers in their midst was what it meant to be a part of the people of God. For us today, we think of hospitality as something extended to others. Maybe we think about it as preparation and decoration and perfection. 
We think of it as paying attention to the details that will make someone else feel comfortable. We think of the hospitality industry, hotels and resorts and restaurants. But for most of the history of the church, hospitality, the caring for and serving others meant response to the physical needs of strangers for food and shelter and protection. It meant offering someone worth and dignity. It equalized the differences over a meal and a place to sleep. And it was this idea of hospitality that Cleopas and his companion offered to the stranger who had been walking with them. In the midst of their despair and hopelessness, they invited him to have a meal and share a place to sleep before continuing on his journey. This concept of biblical hospitality welcomes the stranger into a safe, personal, and comfortable place where there is acceptance and friendship. It demonstrates love and not fear. It allows us to act out of care for others because God has offered care to us. It allows us to offer value to others because God values us. And it allows us to invite others into all that God has prepared for each of us. The disciples and Jesus gather at the table for the evening meal, and it was customary for the head of the household or the host to begin a meal by breaking bread and offering a prayer of thanksgiving. In this case, however, it's Jesus who acts as host and breaks the bread. It is in this action of him breaking the bread that Cleopas and the other finally recognize that it is Jesus who has been with them. It is because they reached out with hospitality and an invitation and care that they realize that it's Jesus who has been with them. And as quickly as they realize it, he's gone. So what might our responses be? How can we live out this responsibility to biblical hospitality? I think one of the things that we have to do is to move out of our comfort zone. There are times when I am called to the hospital to visit someone who's not part of our congregation. And this is not a comfortable place for me. It's not comfortable to go and talk to a stranger who's in the hospital and not feeling well or seriously injured. And there's one particular family couple who I will always remember. They were an older couple who were in town for a graduation of one of their grandchildren and they were in a horrible car accident and she was very seriously injured. They were very active Methodist, uh, members of a Methodist church in Northern California. And while not part of this congregation, we were united in our Methodism. And so they reached out and said, can come, someone come and see her and pray with us? I went to the ICU that first time to see her thinking this would be the only time that I would visit them. But there were a series of procedures and surgery. She was in the hospital for a number of weeks and then in rehab. Um, and then they moved here temporarily while she recovered. And so we exchanged phone numbers. And I said to Frank, call me or text me if you need me. That one step out of my comfort zone led to multiple visits and phone calls and even letters when they returned home several months later. That experience may have brought them some comfort and some connection to their faith and some feeling that they weren't alone, but it strengthened my faith. And it was an example of Christian community to their family who aren't connected to a faith community. It was an example of God's love shared in a practical way. I think we can also extend hospitality to a stranger now, I don't necessarily mean to invite a stranger over for dinner, but it might mean providing and serving dinner for the homeless clients at Bridge to Home. Due to COVID, Family Promise has not been hosting families for most of this year, but they're now in a position where the families have a home 
and they need help with supplies and groceries so that they can prepare a meal and sometimes to provide a dinner. And that might be a way that you can extend hospitality. It might mean sharing your faith, some way that God has helped you. Your story may be more powerful for someone than you can even know. I think about my friends who are in recovery groups, um, recovery programs, and their willingness to share their most vulnerable and painful stories with others who are struggling is a powerful way to offer hope. One of the primary ways that the gospel spread in the early days of the church was this different kind of hospitality that Christians practiced. Ancient Romans typically practiced hospitality for important people. They practiced hospitality for those who could give them something in return. But the Christians became noted for extending hospitality to all even to those who would be considered the most unworthy. And this was a significant part of how the church developed a reputation of love. That's still our call today, to love people. I think the third thing we can do is to expect to encounter Jesus in the unknown. The disciples who were walking on that dusty road that day had no idea what was going to happen. They were so caught up in what was going on around them that they missed what and who was right there with them. I don't know that we're much different. I think that Jesus is always close to us. And I also think that we also, I also think that we don't always realize how close he is. We get so wrapped up in our own stuff that we don't see him. So maybe our challenge is to live expecting to see Jesus among us, to watch and to listen for him and those around us, and to be ready to invite him to dinner or offer him a glass of water, to invite him to join you for online worship, to invite the stranger into a small group. It's watching for the places where people are different from us and striking up a conversation. Now, we're not able to be around people like we normally are, so we're gonna need to be a little creative with this this week. But what I know about God assures me that you will encounter the stranger somehow, some way, somewhere this week. The call of biblical hospitality is to reach out from the love that God has given to you to serve them and to care for them, and to invite them to understand that they have a place in God's kingdom, to reach out with God's goodness and love so that they might know that they are welcomed. Let us pray. God, we are grateful for and uh, thankful for the love that you have for us and the care that you show for us. We are grateful for uh, the opportunities that we have to serve your people. And we pray that this week somehow we would encounter someone who needs to hear about you, and that we would have the courage to invite them to worship, to share our story, to sit and listen to theirs. Remind us of your love for us and the value that you have given to us. And may we be your people who share that in the ways that we can. Amen. Good morning. I'm Steve Stebbins, and I'm a member of the lead team here at the church. Again, I want to thank you for your generosity and support over these last few months when we haven't been able to meet directly here within the church. Your support has allowed us to continue programs that are vital to both our local community and to the mission that we have uh, in the world. Again, thank you, allowing us to continue to support what Jesus Christ has called us to do, to serve the the needy and to support the ministry of the church. God bless you and thank you.
all have tasted something delicious. We've all tasted something delicious that we wanted more of. And I challenge us this week to look at our faith and to look at our relationship with Jesus in that same way. If you've had a relationship with Jesus and you know of God's love through his life and ministry, then you know how good it is. So I challenge us this week to find someone, somehow, some way, be really creative about it. Someone who needs to hear that they are loved and valued. And then extend an invitation to them in some way. Maybe it's to join us for worship on the lawn or worship next Sunday. Go into this day and into the rest of this week knowing that you are loved and cherished and that you are called to share that love with others. Amen.